hundreds of thousands of women and girls living in Atlanta. Nearly a quarter of them are living below the poverty line, struggling to put food on the table, keeping a roof overhead, having a safe place to thrive. There are many barriers that women in poverty face every day. The Atlanta Women's Foundation helps to break these barriers, developing a pathway to nurture growth and unlimited potential for women and girls in our community. We empower nonprofit organizations that serve women and girls who seek their services. We fund healthy, sustainable organizations that provide a support system and offer the opportunity to create a better life. We develop community leaders that transform and cultivate lasting change. We need you. By investing in AWF, you can change the lives of women and girls throughout the Atlanta area. When you invest in women and girls, you invest in a society that works for everyone. Together, we are the Atlanta Women's Foundation. Welcome, I'm Kari Love, the CEO of the Atlanta Women's Foundation. I hope that intro video gave you a glimpse of the important work that AWF is doing, all thanks to your support. We are so glad you've joined us for our Women's History Month Choose to Challenge webinar, featuring former First Lady of Atlanta, Valerie Jackson, and her daughter, musician, Alexandra Jackson. We are thrilled to also have Rose Scott from Atlanta's NPR station, 90.1 FM WABE with us as the moderator for their conversation. I'm sure you've heard about how the pandemic has disproportionately affected women. We are officially in a she session and a pink recession. Women are dropping out of the workforce, sadly. Women in low wage jobs and women of color have been hit the hardest. Women served by organizations that we fund. Here locally in Georgia, women have been no exception. It's heartbreaking news for the organizations we fund and the women and girls we serve. So we wanna share some good news with you today and that is AWF continues to be committed to investing in programs that will help to heal our communities. We are ensuring women and girls in our communities are not left behind. AWF is choosing to challenge those negative effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on women by providing funding and support to the nonprofit organizations in Metro Atlanta that are helping women to eliminate barriers and lead healthy, safe, and economically self-sufficient lives. Just last year, in the early days of COVID-19, you, our donors and friends, stepped up to help women with the immediate effects of the shutdowns. Thanks to your donations last spring, AWF distributed COVID-19 relief grants to six local organizations in June of 2020. And here's what those funds did. In just six months, over 3,200 women living at or below 200% of the federal poverty guidelines had access to critical resources. Over 1,500 women and girls received healthcare services, including, but not limited to, chronic care management, mental health care, reproductive care, general vaccinations, and COVID-19 testing. Over 500 women received financial assistance for housing, utilities, and groceries so they could stay in their homes. We wanna build upon this progress by continuing to help women and girls rebuild their lives. AWF needs you to ensure the success of our newly launched Rebuilding Women's Initiative to raise funds for these organizations who are serving women and girls impacted by the pandemic and job loss. When you do, you'll be helping even more women and girls to have access to mental health and physical health care, as well as vaccine education. Additionally, women will receive mortgage relief, rent, utilities, and grocery assistance to prevent homelessness. Women will have access to safe, quality child care so they can keep their jobs and go to work. And women and girls will have safe shelter. Join us and choose to challenge the exasperated barriers that women and girls continue to face 
in the wake of COVID-19. Our goal is to raise $200,000 by the end of June 2021 to support additional grants. So we are kicking off Women's History Month with the goal to raise at least $50,000 this March. You can make a donation directly to AWF at a level that is meaningful to you at atlantawomen.org backslash WHM. And follow AWF on social media to see what the foundation is doing throughout this month and on our Rebuilding Women's Initiative. We have two upcoming events that we'll be fundraising for those, for those uh, programs. We'll be hosting another webinar on March 31st to culminate Women's History Month. And be sure not to miss out on our AWF All Women's Forward virtual fundraising event on May 19th. This event will feature Sarah Horowitz. She's the former speechwriter for Michelle Obama and the author, author of Here All Along. You can find this information and more at atlantawomen.org. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our guests for today. The former first lady of Atlanta, Valerie Jackson, her daughter, Alexandra Jackson and Rose Scott. And here's a little bit about them. Valerie Richardson Jackson is partner and chair of the board at Jackman Hospitality Inc an Atlanta-based food service company and licensed franchisee of TGI Fridays. During her tenure as Atlanta's first lady, Valerie served as special advisor to the mayor's office of economic development. Her direct efforts helped to bring the Democratic National Convention to Atlanta in 1988 and helped to secure Atlanta's successful bid for the Olympic games in 1996. Today, her voice is recognized as that of the award-winning host of NPR's WAVE's Between the Lines and Valerie Jackson in Conversation, talking with some of today's most notable writers and thinkers. Valerie shared over 25 years of marriage with the late Mayor Maynard Jackson and is the mother of their two daughters, Valerie Amanda and Alexandra. Valerie, we welcome you. you. Alexandra Jackson is an international singer, musician, music instructor and self-esteem advocate. She is the youngest daughter of the late Mayor Maynard Jackson and Valerie. She's a <laughs> classically trained pianist and graduate of the University of Miami studio music and jazz vocal program. And she's been a soloist with Wynton Marsalis, sang for the national anthem for Barack Obama's pres presidential rally and has performed in various music festivals. In 2014, she was brought on by Dove to serve as, a as an original self-esteem expert for two years, where she traveled the country leading workshops aimed at helping young girls and women develop positive body confidence and self-esteem. Alexandra currently lives in Atlanta with her college sweetheart husband, Orion Harris, and they are expecting their first child this spring. Welcome, Alexandra. Thank you, thank you for having me. Valerie and Alexandra's conversation will be moderated by Rose Scott. Rose is an award-winning journalist and the host of the midday news program, Closer Look, heard on Atlanta's NPR station, WABE. Welcome, Rose. Thank and we you. are happy to have Valerie, Alexandra, and Rose for our Choose to Challenge conversation today. Rose, I'll turn it over to you now. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. And a big thank you to the Atlanta Women's Foundation as we celebrate Women's History Month. And of course, Women's History, Women's History Month is all about generations, right? So I'm super excited to be in conversation with my colleague and my friend and the giver of many hats, uh, the lovely Valerie Jackson and the amazing Alexandra Jackson. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I like to think I have a very smooth and calming radio voice. But Valerie Jackson, <laughs> Valerie could talk about cutting grass and I'd be like, oh, that's so wonderful. <laughs> so I'm super excited to have this conversation. And I know, look, normally we'd all probably be together in a real nice ballroom with great food and maybe some nice Chardonnay because that's, that's how I roll. But as we all know, you know, the last 12 months have been clearly extraordinary, um, unprecedented, obviously, and even tragic. But hopefully, you know, 2021 is a year of relaunching, reinvigorating, and maybe even changing the way we operate in society as a whole. And that includes the plight of women, and especially women of color, women who are low wage earners, 
rural women, our trans sisters, and our women veterans, and also future women, our young girls. And I think that's a good place to start with this conversation with Valerie and Alexandra. And I just want them to just open with a little reflection on how this pandemic through your lens has either amplified or highlighted the challenges facing women. So Valerie, I'll let you begin with that. I know it's a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The effect of the pandemic has been, it's, it's even difficult for me to articulate it because it has been so damaging, especially to women of color. And um, I'm hoping that eventually what will come out of this pandemic is that more of us will understand and realize that we really are codependent on each other. There's so much tribalism right now going on in the country, but it's, I, I like to think of society as like in our bodies, each cell has a function in our human body. Mm-hmm. And the same exists in society. Each person is a cell in the body of society or in the body of politics. And it's up to us to perform the function that's necessary for us to keep a healthy society. Mm-hmm. If we don't take care of our bodies, we get sick. Yeah. If we don't do the responsible things that we're supposed to do as citizens, society gets sick. And so I'm hoping that we're learning that we just can't be about me. It's got to be about we. And that, you know, it, it's, it takes more than 50% of the people wearing masks. It takes 100% of people wearing masks. Mm-hmm. So I'm hoping that the pandemic, as much as it has challenged us, that it has also given an opportunity, because I do believe in that old Chinese verb that um, a crisis, the, the, the character for the word crisis is the same character for the word opportunity. And mm-hmm. so I'm thinking that out of this crisis that we all glean some opportunities to become stronger from the adversity, mm-hmm. to reach out to, to others and help, and to know when to keep quiet so that my daughter can take over. <laughs> I'll, I'll call her. <laughs> Uh, that's great. Alexandra, what about you? Just a reflection on this, this last year. Absolutely. Um, everything my mother just said, times two. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard to follow Valerie Jackson. Let me tell you, I've been trying my whole life here. So Rose, I think you set me up there a little bit. <laughs> but, <I'm sorry. laughs> um, but no, I, you know, what I, of course, this, this pandemic has been incredibly difficult for everyone, obviously. And, and everyone has their own journey and their own story. Um, and for me, the only way that I could really focus on the, um, the light at the end of the tunnel was focusing on what it is that I do have, mm-hmm. the people I do have around me, the amazing women who continue to uplift me and my family. Um, you know, I am expecting a baby soon, um, few weeks actually soon. So I have been going through this pandemic pregnant and it has definitely been a trying time, but I focus on the incredible love and support that has been around me. And I also take great, um, um, appreciation for being able to spend more time with my mother actually, because, um, you know, we want to make sure that she stays safe. So, you know, we want to be able to do whatever it is that we can for her, spend the time with her, um, make sure that, that anything she needs, we can hopefully provide that. So it really just becomes, where can you find that glimmer of hope? Mm -hmm. And for me, a big part of it was being able to spend more time with my mother. Um, and I know a lot of people have not had the opportunity or the blessing to be able to do that. And I don't take that lightly. And, um, and I just appreciate every day that, that I do have on this earth. 
Well, well, one of the reasons why she has more time to spend with me is because unfortunately the pandemic has meant that she has not been able to perform. The gigs are all canceled. Right. She can't teach piano and voice mm -hmm. like she used Mom, to. we'll 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 get there, Mom. We'll get there, Mom. I think, you know, <laughs> I think I think Miss Rose has a an agenda here. But you know what? Actually, she's right because my very next segue into the question was look, we need to acknowledge that five million women had to leave the workforce in this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so that leads me to this question. When we talk about, okay, then how do we get over this next hurdle? And Alexandra, I'll start with you. You know, where do you see that? Is it going to take a holistic approach? It can't just be from Washington, can't just be on a state level, can't just be on a city level. It's mm -hmm. going to take private and public partnerships. And I just want to say this right now. I have just been just overwhelmed with how these nonprofits in the Atlanta area, because I talk to these folks every day, how they have stepped up yeah. to help so many people in need. Mm -hmm. Since March of last year, every conversation on Closer Look has been about some nonprofit that has stepped up. And even in a time when maybe the government was just a little bit slow in, in reacting. So when we talk about how do we get through this through the next to the next hurdle, Alexandra, what is your what do you what is your personal hope that how we help women in particular? Will it take a holistic approach? Uh, I personally do believe that. And just like you said, with it, you know, needing to be smaller than large government, um, local government, it really, like you said, with these nonprofits, it starts in the community. It starts in your street, in your neighborhood, and then you continue to branch out from there. Um, because I think the more personal approach and the more personal connections you're able to have with people is what helps strengthen everyone in a time of crisis. Mm -hmm. um, it's very rare that you'll see people rise up and, and find this newfound hope if they don't feel like anyone understands what they're going through or they don't feel like there's any um, hope or support around them. So I think it, it really starts from your, your microcosm, your neighborhood, and then just finding out from there, how can we all make this better so we can make the larger masses better? Um, and I, I, I think that it will take some time. I think people are very used to now kind of being more of a, of a hermit lifestyle mm -hmm. um, and they're a little scared to get back out there. But once people start, I think, tasting that normality possibly mm -hmm. coming back, um, they'll want to give and they'll want to help more. Valerie, it is not lost on you how important this community was, particularly Atlanta community and particularly those communities of color, how important that was to your beloved Maynard. We know that. And in the time of crisis, what he would do to help people. Now, he didn't have to deal with a pandemic, but he had a lot of other pandemics. This is true. This is true. How, how do you see, where do we begin to help, particularly women, when we, as we get to, through this pandemic? Well, I think First of all, once again, ditto to what my daughter just said. We're <laughs> complimenting each other today here. But she said some very important things. Um, and I think Maynard would be doing exactly what she said. Maynard would be walking the streets of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I mean, every Sunday morning, he'd take the girls out to drive through the city to see what was wrong in the city. Where were the potholes? Where were the broken trees? Where was the garbage not collected? And so he's a, he was a very hands-on kind of mayor and he would be doing the very same thing today. But I think he would have a little bit more of a challenge because things have changed uh, in the last 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. since, well, he hadn't, it wasn't that long ago that he was mayor, but uh, 25 years ago, let's say, because now um, we have things that he didn't have to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, I mentioned earlier, the tribalism, mm -hmm. uh, social media, which has become a blessing and a curse. Mm -hmm. you know? um, I think I'm afraid that if we get too entrenched in these social, social medias, which I'm not a part of, I don't do Facebook or, or 
Instagram or whatever they're called. But I think because so many people are doing that, they're losing the personal connection with people. It's so much easier to be rude over a TV or, or a laptop than mm -hmm. it is if you're standing next to that person and, you know, and, and, and have a communication you know, with that person live. So um, the challenges that, that make the um, tragic uh, situation even more tragic is that it's a different world um, now and there are so many more variables now to have to manipulate and to balance. And so I, I don't, um, I don't, I'm, I'm not, I'm proud of every mayor in this country because Maynard used to always say being a mayor was the, next to being president of the United States, being a mayor was the most difficult job mm -hmm. uh, in the country, in the world. So I'm hoping that, um, that like Alexander said, that we start uh, from the communities and, and move out from that. And it made me think about Maynard's MPU's Neighborhood Planning Unit. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think that, that we can all do, maybe to do a little bit better, is to uh, actually, Maynard's grandfather, John Wesley Dobbs, had a theme of three Bs mm -hmm. as the road to success. Mm -hmm. Anybody's success, personal success, city success, the three Bs. The first one was the book. The mm -hmm. second one was the ballot. The third one was the book. Now the book meant education, mm -hmm. not just to go to school, but to educate yourself, to read, mm -hmm. to research the issues, the problems that you might be facing, to research about that job that you might be interested in. So do your homework, as he would say. The second, the ballot, means that you have to be involved politically. You've got to get involved in your neighborhood, in your school, mm -hmm. in your charities. Um, you have got to um, participate in politics. The least that you can do is to vote. Mm -hmm. But more so than that, you can run for office. The, mm -hmm. the school board, the city council, the NPU uh, president, there are so many opportunities that we can serve and learn more about us and others. Mm -hmm. And the third, of course, and I'll try to be quick, is the buck, mm -hmm. economic opportunity and exposure. We have got to continue to create economic opportunities for our people, for all people, especially women and mm -hmm. people of color. Economic opportunity means that we can't just settle for equality we have got to go for equity. Now, the difference between equality and equity is that equality means that if you've got three people standing behind a fence and they're of different heights, equality means that each of them get the same size box mm -hmm. to look over the fence. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not going to work for some of them because some of them are going to be shorter than others. <laughs> so equity mm -hmm. means that they get what they need Absolutely. to help them to survive or to see over the fence. So we have to start moving more, from, not from equality, but in addition to equality, we have got to move into fair equity. For Absolutely. And Valerie, I want to stay with you because, listen, we're also in this space of social and racial justice. And I can't tell you how many conversations I've been leading about allyship. Now, that's a whole nother segment, but the importance of as women, now we're talking about women as a collective, what we need to do, but then when you unravel those layers and you get into subsets, mm -hmm. the importance of allyship and non women of color supporting black women, supporting our, our Latina sisters as well. Valerie, you know, you spent, when you were at Wharton, I mm -hmm. want to ask you to go back to those days. Who did you turn to for support or <laughs> advice or, or, or simply a listening ear? Did you have anybody? I had nobody, honey. I had nobody. And it was same in undergrad at Virginia Commonwealth University. Because I majored in business, most of the time I was the only woman in the class and the only black in the class. And mm -hmm. then moving up to, um, and that was interesting because in 1971, when I graduated, mm -hmm. um, the, the business community wasn't woke yet. They weren't oh. ready for women and for blacks. Yeah. And so when I would go to a, a, an opportunity where a company was on campus interviewing and, and recruiting, the white male who was always who the rep was, 
would sit there and tell me about all the reasons I probably wouldn't like this work, as opposed to trying to encourage me to come to the company. And I don't know if it was because I was black or a woman, but either way, they weren't interested in me. Two mm. years, three years later, coming out of Wharton, even though at Wharton, I was still the only woman and the only black often in the class. Mm. I discovered that, that um, I was in a class of, of, of like the DuPonts, you know, of Delaware mm -hmm. and the, the royal families of Nigeria. I was in mm -hmm. high cotton, as my mother would say. Okay? Yeah. And nobody was in that high cotton to help this poor colored girl from Richmond, Virginia, right? Um, the, 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 the guys had, when I say guys, I mean the white men, had study groups. I never heard of a study group. So they'd get together and they'd share you know, their homework problems and they'd all work on one or two and then they'd get back together and exchange the answers and so forth. I had to sit up till two o'clock every morning doing all of them by myself. I had no, no, Hmm. No study groups, so to speak. Um, hmm. So I was kind of traveling through that by myself. And it didn't get much better when I got into corporate life after I graduated from Wharton. As a matter of fact, though, I must say there was a big difference in my reception in the business community from when I came out of VCU and I got one or two offers. When I came out of Wharton, I got more than the average white male got in terms of job offers. I think the average mm. white male was seven. I got between 12 and 14. But that was at the right time, at the yeah. right place. You know, mm. people, the, the corporations were beginning to open up and they knew for their own sake they needed to reach out to women and to people of color. But yeah. it's a long, it's a solo journey for the most part. And alliances, like you said, mm -hmm. that's what we have to build on because that's the only way really that a group of people succeed is through alliances. Mm -hmm. John Wesley Dobbs, who was Maynard's grandfather, when uh, Hartsfield was the mayor, and when, when at that time it was a, it was a weak mayor's uh, government. The, mm -hmm. the mayor was not a very strong government. The city manager was the one who really ran the city. Mm -hmm. But when Maynard became mayor, there was a change in the charter and I guess if they had known a black man was gonna be the first mayor <laughs> under the new charter, they might've thought twice about it, but the mayor had much more power under the new charter. Um, but before that, uh, John Wesley Dobbs got a, created a coalition, an alliance of, mm -hmm. of, of um, representatives from the church, from the black business community, from the public service, the teachers and so forth. He created an alliance and then went to Hartsfield, Mayor Hartsfield and said, if you hire some black policemen, we guarantee you 10,000 votes. And that's how we got our first black policeman in 1948 because Hartsfield traded off with an alliance, you know, to, to, to hire black uh, policemen. Now it was only eight, and they weren't allowed to change in the white police stations or to patrol white neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. you know, they couldn't arrest white people, but it was a start. Yeah. And it was through mm -hmm. an alliance that they did that. So we've got to create those same kind of alliances among women and people of color. Alexandra, when we talk about allyship and non-women of color being a support for women of color, mm -hmm. um, particularly black women and Latino women, you, as you reflect on that, what does that look like? Because as your mom mentioned, woke, some folks say they woke, but they really sleep. They ain't woke. They just want to say they woke, but I don't know when you woke and when you're not woke. Right, right. <laughs> so, when, you're na when you're napping. Right, when you're napping, right. So <laughs> how do you, <laughs> what does that look like in terms of allyship and alliance? What does that look like through your lens? Uh, well, I would say in my lens, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the music world a lot, mm -hmm. the, um, the, the art world, the entertainment world. Um, that's a lot where my lens is. And for me, I was very lucky in being able to go to University of Miami, where there is a melting pot of people from all sorts of cultures, all backgrounds, mm -hmm. um, and all different neighborhoods. And what brought us together was one commonality, and that was the love of music. And mm -hmm. I like to look at allyship as creating a band or creating a song because mm -hmm. you need 
to understand where other people are coming from in order to harmonize. You need to mm -hmm. know their story, their background in order to create beautiful melodies and beautiful sound. And you can't necessarily do that if you're staying in the same, if you're, if you're, if you're singing the same notes over and over again, meaning you have the mm -hmm. same type of people with you around you all the time, it, it's going to create a stunt in growth. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the allyship of people outside of strong black women, mm -hmm. uh, outside of strong women in general, also goes to non-women. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it's important to, to make sure that before that entry, before, they, before anyone crosses that line into that community, that everyone has the, the greater good at their hearts for everybody. Mm -hmm. And for mm -hmm. me, if someone has the greater good um, in, in the center of their heart for, for what you're focusing on, then they're an ally, no matter the race, the gender, you know, sexual orientation, we are all in this together to make a better community. And that's an ally. And I also want to add, because your mom, Valerie, is a great listener, you know, during their interviews, she listens to people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also kind of important when we talk about allyship. Coming to the table sometimes means you should just listen to the plight of other people who do not look like you. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes therein lies a problem because folks want to tell you how you should feel, especially if you're a person of color, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I want to ask you this though, because I asked Valerie about who she would turn to in those days at Wharton. I imagine in your days of needing some support, you, you had a great resource in mom, mm -hmm. right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And she, you know, I, a lot of people ask me where I'm able to draw on inspiration mm -hmm. or where some of my confidence may come from. And a lot of that is the fact that I was able to see someone mm -hmm. carry herself that way through life. And even if, if in, in someone else's situation who may not have that in a mother, if they have it in a teacher or a mentor or a coach or even someone on television they may not know, but just someone that you can gravitate towards and learn from. And, and, and when you're younger, you may want to emulate and yeah. think that you want to be them. And that helps you just develop your own sense of self. And mm -hmm. being able to see my mother and know her story and know her history, all that she has gone through mm -hmm. from integrating her high school with her brothers in Virginia going through threats, going through bullying, um, you know, going through VCU and Wharton is one of the first, you know, like I, 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 I saw so many firsts um, and it was really inspiring because I knew how difficult they were, but she was still here. She was still standing. She was still strong. And she would remind me of that in the times where I would doubt myself. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it'd be, it'd be, easy for me to think, oh, life is so hard. And I, I didn't get the part I wanted in the play. And then I look at my mother and I'm like, you know, they, they put sand in her locker, you know, they, yeah. they, they, they burned, right. They burned a cross on my, on, on, on our family lawn when my father was elected Mm -hmm. first black mayor of Atlanta, you know? And so for me, it's like, okay, let's have some perspective on the challenge that you're going through. <laughs> if your parents can go through 100 yeah. times worse than this, you can develop the courage and the and the, the strength to get through what you need to get through. So I was I'm very lucky to to be able to have that as 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 an example. And I mean I'm 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 literally right now sitting in my childhood bedroom. Oh. Like up, upstairs from from my mother. So I can, I can feel her energy. Yeah. It's strong, y'all. It's strong. <laughs> well, you know, that, that's generational too. That, yeah. Because my mother was what you would call a, a quiet warrior. Mm -hmm. She didn't march in the streets and she didn't demonstrate. But when we moved into a new neighborhood just across the city line and had to go to a county high school, my mother, the woman who raised eight children, and one husband, 
and at 50 years old went to school and became a nurse, a private duty nurse, this woman said to us, you're going to that school because I'm not going to bus you 18 miles past a perfectly mm -hmm. good school just to get to a black school. Yeah. And so she insisted that we enroll. We didn't want to do it because right. we didn't want to do it. But my mm -hmm. mother insisted that, that we be enrolled in that school. And we were the, you know, the only blacks for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, but we all made our mark on the school before we left because I was determined that reason, the way I was going to op overcome this barrier was to, 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 to show the haters you know, mm -hmm. that I could do it. And even better than mm -hmm. they could do it. Yeah. And, uh, I, and my brother was an artist and he sculpted uh, the name of the school uh, mascot was the warrior. He sculpted mm -hmm. an Indian head. Perfect. I mean, it was, it, the principal was so impressed. He shipped it off to Ohio and added literally bronzed and, and, and it stood out in front of the school for 30 years until vandals pulled it down. But mm -hmm. we all left our mark in, in some reason. But my mother, to get back to my mother, she was a strong warrior. When, when um, a girl came to, a classmate came to school one day and said, oh, I just got a job at the telephone company. They're hiring down there. So if you want a job, you need to go. Well, I thought I was ready to graduate from my $13 a day cleaning job that I had on Saturdays. And I said, well, let me go down here and apply. So I did, I went down, I applied. And they told me that, unfortunately, we've, we've filled all of our positions and we don't have any more uh, positions available. And so, you know, I, I accepted that. Several days later, maybe four or five days later, another classmate comes in, guess what? I just got a job at the telephone company. Mm. And I was like, you what? And I said, yeah. they told me they didn't have any more positions. And she said, well, I got one and they didn't say anything about not having, I went home and told my mother, my mother got on the telephone <laughs> <laughs> and she got off of that telephone. I had a job at the telephone company. And I, that's what I'm talking about. That kind of strength, yeah. you know, which, which got, allowed me to continue it to the next generation. So. Well, and, and it's funny because it's like y'all looking at my script and y'all have not seen my script. <laughs> the next part of this conversation is about working cross generations because I am of this age now where I have been saying, you young folks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am in, I am, I am officially am in auntie mode, you know, yeah. where I say, you, you, I didn't even have a cell phone when I was your age. That's, me, that's right. me too, Rose, me too, Rose. I'm, I'm there too. <laughs> <laughs> Graduating into that mode, but working, working across generations for the good of the cause, because, you know, there was a lot of criticism last summer, uh, but the new wave of, of protesters and how they did things. And then there was this whole disconnect maybe between the old school and a new school of civil rights leaders and social justice warriors. How do we as women work through all, all of this with our, our youngins, our mid, middle folks and our, our seasons and our, our elders? Valerie, how do we all get past the, I guess the egos and everything else if we're yeah, all working as women for a common cause? That's, that's part of it, you're right, um, egos. Um, and, and I went, I was looking for something. Okay, here it is. Women, women make better leaders. And I'm not just saying that a, a lot of great people have said that, but the Dalai Lama says this, and I want to read this quote mm -hmm. in the West, you have education. This is good. You have technology. This is good but you do not educate your people in values of the heart, of compassion. This you must do. Mm. Women know this because peace is implicit in women. You put boys together, they make war. You put women together, they make peace. Mm. Women are leaders of the future. And I think we need to listen to that wise man, the Dalai Lama. And he's not the only one who said that. Obama has said that women make better leaders. We have got to harness that natural compassion that we as women have and spread it out among others. And, and that way, it doesn't matter what generation it is, what sex you are, what race you are. Compassion is compassion. Love is love. And it starts. I'm not sure if I answered your question. But. No, I think no. I think that's great. I mean, Alexandra, you are of the of a generation, so you know 
but but there, sometimes there is tension. And Valerie, you know, there was tension within the civil rights movement. There was tension within Martin's group of people. Right. How do we as women, Malcolm X. you know, absolutely. How do we work through all that if at the end of the day, the, 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 the outcome that we want is equity and equality that Valerie talked about. And let's be real clear, and I might be dating myself, and I know that someone in the audience, Pearl, is out there, great, one of Atlanta's just institutions, can tell you, look at the women's ERA in the 70s. That didn't include black women. That's that right. didn't include the plight of black women. It did not. So how do we work through as women across generations to make sure that we can all achieve the outcome that we want? Um, well, I, I, like I said, I bring everything, a lot of things back to music and the, the kind of turning point for me to understand how important it is to reach forward and connect with the younger generation was when I was teaching a voice lesson a few years ago and I told the young lady to prepare a song of her choice, anything she wanted, free day, just perform it, you know, at our next lesson. So she gets up and she's all proud and she says, Today, I'm going to perform Vogue by Glee, the TV show. And I said, oh, you mean the version by Glee, the TV show? You mean Madonna's Vogue, right? And she said, oh, my God, Madonna did it too? <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was like, this lesson's over. I, I, I'm so offended right now. That 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 you said but Don did it too. I mean, I just I I was I was so upset for myself yeah. and, for, and for my generation and my people. And then I realized it's not her fault. Right. It's up to me to mm -hmm. bring this knowledge to her. I mm -hmm. had two choices. I could say, How dare you, you youngins, y'all don't know your history, blah, blah, blah. Or I could I could use this as a teaching moment and say, you know what? Madonna was, was the originator of this song. And what would be great for you is whenever you bring something to the table, research it, mm -hmm. find out the originators, find mm -hmm. out how it developed into what you know it to be now. Mm -hmm. And then in the future, someone may come back and say that you were a part of affecting them with mm -hmm. this. So, yeah. so I think with, with the connection of the generations, why there has been a good connection at some point is because the elders have reached forward, mm -hmm. given their hands and said, let me teach you what I know. But then they're open enough to say, now you <clears throat> find a way to add your voice mm -hmm. and come back and tell me what you developed and tell me what mm -hmm. you learned. Right. That's how we keep the conversation and the positivity and the growth moving from generation to generation, instead of just mm -hmm. believing that my generation knows best and you're just not going to get it because that's where everything will stop. So mm -hmm. that's why I, you know, I, I think of that, that moment with that lesson, we're just oh, right <laughs> in the heart. And I, and I, and I take it and I say, you know what, we're going to learn together and grow together. Amen. Absolutely, absolutely. I want to I want to shift for a moment and talk about something else that's very important, and that is our mental health as women, and and how we, particularly for women of color and our Latina sisters and our, and our women in rural communities, how we seek mental health and resources. Uh, Alexander, I want to start with you. When you are having the the moment, or if you've had a moment, other than your mom, you know, have you who do you reach out to in terms of, look, I'm having not a good time right now. I'm not in a good space. Now I don't want to get all up in your business, but just the importance of seeking help, mm -hmm. mental health and women and just the importance of it. So I'm, I'm a firm believer in understanding when your family is the place to turn, when your friends are the place to turn and when a professional is the place to turn. I have turned to mm -hmm. all three. Um, my husband is a huge, huge support for me. We understand each other. We've grown together since we've known each other since we were 18, 19 years old. Uh, my sister, Valerie Amanda, knows me next to my husband probably better than anyone and my mother. Um, but sometimes they're too close. And so I may 
move to a friend and say, hey, I, I, I need to just discuss this with you. Can you talk me through it? Mm-hmm. But then maybe they're too close to me, you know, and because our, our friends are like our family and they want to just, yeah. just help pump you up. But sometimes that's not what is best for you to know mm-hmm. in the moment. So, um, uh, so then I, there are times where you want to turn to professional and especially mm-hmm. in the black community, the idea of professional mental health and therapy still carries a very negative stigma of, of, around it. Um, you know, there's a history of us being like, you go to the church, mm-hmm. you pray to Jesus, and that is what, you know, heals the soul. But sometimes you need to sit on a couch in front of someone who has studied this and gotten a degree, mm-hmm. and there's no shame in that. And that was something that I needed when I realized that I had not properly processed the death of my father. And mm-hmm. I grieved much later than what I had thought because it happened right before my sophomore year of college. I went right back to school. I didn't know that I should take time off. And it, it, it was just a way for me to escape. And then by escaping for a few years, it hit me like a ton of bricks mm-hmm. when I was least expecting it. Mm-hmm. And the only person or people who would know how to bring that out of me and to analyze it was a professional. And, and I think that if more people were a little more open-minded about going to someone who does this as a profession, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like do, do, do what you do best. And then what you can't do, you find someone who knows how to do it. So the mental health of our women in our society is what, like my mother said, women are, are the best leaders. Mm-hmm. We can't be the best leaders if we're not the best versions of ourselves. And mm-hmm. the best versions of ourselves require us to have constant self-evaluation, self-understanding, self-healing, self-support. And that's what's going to help continue us on this strong woman road mm-hmm. in life. I'm sorry, if yeah. I could piggyback on that for a quick mm-hmm. second. A lot of people say, well, I can't afford to go to a therapist. Mm-hmm. That may be. A lot of people can't afford to go to a therapist in terms of an actual, uh, go to a, an office, a paying uh, a doctor. But there are organizations, mm-hmm. there are charity groups um, that allow you know people to come and, and, and and have that communication with a professional. And that's what I'm so thankful for, that we do have resources in the community that can help you that you don't have to pay for. So don't ever let that be an excuse. Well, I can't afford a therapist. And I wanna say that the Chris 180 organization is an, is, and I, I don't mean to plug organizations, because I love all y'all, because y'all sent me emails saying, you didn't mention us, Rose, but I know that Chris 180 is, is doing a, a fabulous job, and there's so many other organizations out there. And look, let's be really clear, you know, because I don't want to sit up here and preach. 2020 was horrible for me. I lost a brother. I lost my sister. I lost my great uncle. My beloved cat died in January of this year, and that I had for 21 years. I was a complete mess. And I've had the support of my sister friends, and I don't mind calling them out right now, but they know who they are. Um, D, you know, Trina, you know, Jennifer, because I don't have any family here. And so the support of my sisters and reaching out to someone saying, you know what, I'm a mess right now and I need help. Because at the same time, I have to be Rose Scott every day. It, it is tough to be Rose Scott every day. Yeah, it's tough to be Valerie every day. It's tough to be Alexandra every day. We have to acknowledge when we need help, ladies. And for our fellows that are in the audience and our other spouses, y'all need to understand and be there for us when you see us having a hard time. Mm-hmm. And just say, hey, what do you need? Mm-hmm. Something else I want to just wrap before we finish, before we wrap up, there's a question here from Karen. And Karen says, I'm moving to Atlanta. What is the best way to become effective at supporting the community? especially that of women and girls, because now we get into the future and how do we support our young girls who are going to become women. Alexandra, you do a lot in the community. Uh, what advice would you give to Karen? For Karen, I honestly would, would say, you know, it's funny, I'm, I'm a Google queen. 
Um, literally anything. And my husband asks me like, you know, how do you say this word? I say, Hey Google, how do you pronounce blah, blah, blah. I spell the word. I'd be like anything. And, and I can't tell you what can, could come up if you, if you just know what to search for. Um, and so depending on specifically the type of community or the, or the type of, of, um, organization that you're looking for, Karen, I would really just, um, do some research online um, because these organizations are very good at knowing what keywords people are looking for. So mm -hmm. if you want to specifically help young Latina girls under the age of 13, mm -hmm. you would, you know, Google help young Latina girls Atlanta, you know, mm -hmm. and, and what will pop up is, is incredible. Um, the other thing I would suggest is, is joining um, some groups online. You know, through Facebook groups, or um, or if you're not on social media, um, you can Google them also, and just join email lists because mm -hmm. these these email lists will will bring you opportunities that you didn't even consider before. Because everyone partners together, and that's one of the great things about Atlanta is everyone loves to partner and help each other. So yeah. good luck. Hope you enjoy it. We welcome you. <laughs> Valerie, you want to add anything to that? Well, listen, all I can say is I used to tell her to go look it up. But I <laughs> that meant she had to go upstairs and pull out the encyclopedia. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and Karen, what I will tell you too, if you want to email me, rose at wabe.org. There's so many great organizations in the community here in Atlanta that are doing such great work with, with our, our LGBTQ youth, our Latinas, you know, our Asian Americans, our, you know, just so many organizations here. So just hit me up on email and I will, I will point you in the right direction. And don't forget um, about AWF. Atlanta. Atlanta. Oh, yeah. Atlanta. Oh, yeah. Atlanta. AWF. Yeah, of course. They do great work. Great work. <laughs> um, before we get to the close, close, I do want um, each of you to take a minute or so to talk about where you hope the state of women will be in, let's say, Mm, five years. Alexandra? I would say in five years, I hope that some things that are considered shocking that women accomplish is no longer shocking. Mm -hmm. It has become a norm. Mm -hmm. um, having a, a, a woman like Kamala Harris as our vice president, mm -hmm will be amazing to continue on in other organizations and, and governmental positions, but it won't be so shocking anymore. Right. You know, I, I, my mom, this is what happens when you leave pictures up to your mother and you don't approve them ahead of time. She throws in your football article out of nowhere in, in the beginning of the, of the screed. So I was not aware that was in there, but I did play football. I was the first girl at my school to play seventh grade football. And yes. to this day, I still am the, the only girl that has stepped foot on that football field. And, and not as kicker, not as kicker. Yes, I, oh. I, was an, I was an offensive and defensive tackle. Okay, okay. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but my, my point is it back then and now it is still shocking to know that a girl has played football in mm -hmm. five years, will that become more of like a cool, we got another one mm -hmm. versus we got the first. So I hope in five years, these first become normal and we're able to continue to uplift and, and celebrate all that these amazing women and girls mm -hmm. can accomplish with just a little bit of help and a little bit yeah. of lift from the community. All right. Valerie, women in five years overall. Okay. What, what I would like to see uh, is more women in government. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we're making inroads into the corporate C-suite and so forth, but still we got a long ways to go, but we need more women in government. And I say that because a lot of people can influence public policy, you know, corporations, organizations, individuals, but only elected officials can set public policy policy. Mm -hmm. And public policy determines every aspect of your life. What side of the street you can park on, what school you can go to, how long you can, you know, uh, just just every aspect, you know, your, your driving license, you know, how long can you um, 
you know, stay on that side of the street versus having to move your car? What school can you go to? Everything <laughs> in your life is dictated by public policy. And the only people who can set public policy are elected officials. So we need to get more women in elected positions so that they can set policies for mm -hmm. our cities, our states, and our country. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to throw this in there. You know how do you say, if you see something, say something? Right. I just want us as women, regardless of your religious affiliation, your political affiliation, when you see something that is wrong, when you see something that is being touted from the White House or whatever, say something. Right. Don't forsake the good of humanity just for a political party or a religion. That's just my personal opinion. Use your power, your voice. Usually. Absolutely. I want to challenge all of you out there in the audience to pledge to yourself what you're going to do to impact the community. And that community may be your own household. Because look, I understand. I get it. I have over 20 nieces and nephews. And right now I'm focusing on them and trying to help them get where they are. But I'm also still focusing on my job as a journalist. So take a moment and just see, pledge to yourself. You know, what can you do? If it means supporting the Atlanta Women's Foundation, do it. If it means becoming a member to WABE, <laughs> do, do it. I have to do that. I, they may be on this call. I have to do that. But whatever it is, for the good of the community and humanity, do it. Alexandra, Valerie, I have enjoyed this conversation immensely. Thank you so much. I hope that I we were say able one, to... One closing point that... Yes, um, go ahead. I, I, I was affected by the pandemic in terms of the show that I had on WAB has been put on hiatus for a while because I couldn't get into the studio and I yeah. didn't have you know the equipment to set up at home. But I am so impressed and proud of the Atlanta Women's Foundation that I want to kick off their drive this month with a thousand dollar contribution from Alexandra and me to the Atlanta Women's Foundation as our way to, to to oh, overcome wow. some of the barriers. Oh, thank you, Valerie yeah. and Alexandra, so much. We really appreciate that more than you know. Um, and we thank you all for being a part of our afternoon, our evening together. And, um, and thank you for choosing to challenge barriers um, now and forward. Um, and we hope that our audience um, has enjoyed this program. And again, thank you, Valerie, Rose, and Alexandra so much for your time, your wisdom, your insight, your inspiring messages. Um, and yes, indeed, we are all leaders. And that is, um, we need to all be together, all women moving forward for a much better, greater community. So thank you so much for that pledge and, and, um, and all uh, for everyone who attended this afternoon evening. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, AWF. We appreciate Thank you. you so much. I miss you, Rose. And I know I miss you too. We're going to get you back in the studio. I'm waiting. Okay. <laughs> Everyone be safe. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Be well.